Um, now, if how you're... are we in shops? Well, um, I... um, I'm not going to show your knees. <laughs> <That's all laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> we are very different in character from people on the continent. That's why in two world wars we've been able to do so much to defeat the forces of oppression and save uh, liberty for Europe. What we're talking about is the biggest diminution of parliamentary responsibility that we've known, I believe, in the lifetime of our parliament. How is a person to vote who says, I do not want our powers taken away. Our parliament is central to the life of our nation. It was the chimes of Big Ben that rang out across Europe during the war. I do not want our powers taken away. You'll find extremist candidates coming up, and you'll find that they'll vote for them. There's one such obvious way to deal with it, because it's a constitutional matter, and that is by a referendum. You push too hard, you get a very quick reaction. If I feel an instinct very quickly, I usually find that that's what um, British people feel. The character of the British people is unique. It is that which has shaped our institutions. It is that which has made them so valuable. It is that which makes us stand up for liberty more fiercely than any other country in Europe. And we must never submit that character to any other nation. Look out, Oh, me too. You make it nice and bright, don't you? Well, that's the foundation. Though. That's the foundation version. Does that just come out? Sort of for today yes, well, yes, it's, it's, it's available now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, it's such a long time since one. Uh, The legalities take such a long time. Yeah. You can't right. Before you say go, you've got, well, you've got to be strictly correct, yes. Whether it's charitable status or yes, not well, charitable status. Yes, well, you can do it in two ways. And, uh, so. Anyway, it was uh, all, all sorted out over lunch. Huh? It's been a busy year, though, isn't it? Yeah. Do any think it's. Uh, a year, a year plus a day, isn't it? Is what they say they say, but it surely was November the 22nd when I resigned. I'm almost a bit. I think I'm so. A bit well, so it was. It yeah. was the 22nd, yeah. it was today. Yeah. Yes, today, yes, it is so definitely year today. Precisely. Yes, yeah, precisely. Yes, yeah. Well, it's certainly gone quickly. I'm just sort of looking over your shoulder as yes. you're looking at yes. it, if you don't mind. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I can see a picture in it now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I can see you on the doorstep there. Yes. Um. Good. Thanks very much. It's not sparkling, it is. Right. Um, is that one right? We have a lot of time. I'd like to just a uh, you know, word or two about the foundation at the mm -hmm. top. Um, and then if we may just to get into some of the, the European things, mm -hmm. just expanding a little on what you've said. So if mm -hmm. we could possibly, you know, record mm -hmm. about 15 or 20 minutes, we're mm -hmm. thinking about a sort of 10 minute slot on either 10, something of that order. 10 minutes is quite a lot. It's quite a bit. But you don't want to be too expansive. No, no, as, as always, you know. Um, now if how you're... are we in shops? Um, um, I'm not going to show your knees. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's a relief. That's a relief. Uh, I don't, I don't, no, I've had the makeup done. That's that's, that's yeah. why. And when and the hair's tied, it makes a lot of difference. And then. And then, and then a bit about Europe. A bit about so, Europe. Yes. Yeah. yes. If that's all right. <coughs> Good. Right. Is everyone happy? Yes. <coughs> and Michael, we are ready. Mrs. Thatcher, it's exactly a year to the day since you resigned, and you've spent part of the day organising your new foundation with the meeting of the trustees. The reports are that you've raised a great deal of money. Some reports say it's as much as 12 million. Uh, but what now have you decided that the money is 
going to be spent on in actual practical terms? Well, I wish we had raised anything like that amount of money or even a fraction of it. We've not really been in a position to go out and appeal until we got the foundation set up legally. And it really is set up partly as a charitable foundation. So all that money goes to the Charities Aid Foundation, the Margaret Thatcher Fund, which administers the charitable part. And then there'll be some things which will not warrant charitable status, and they go to a company limited by guarantee called the Margaret Thatcher Foundation. Now, we've only just got the formalities completed, so we'll be very pleased to receive sums very much less than the amount you indicate. But whatever sums come in, they'll be very welcome, and we want not only big amounts of money, but we want a lot of small amounts from a lot of people who believe in the same things as we do. Well, if it's not 12 million, how much is it? Well, we haven't really gone out to appeal yet. You can't before you've got the charitable foundation and the company properly set up. Now, this was the first meeting today. The thing's been full of rumours, but I say I wish we had a fraction of that sum. And is it really going to be more of a charity or a political pressure group? No, there will be the charitable work, which is educational work, training work. I think everything that we do which helps people in communist countries or other countries that have been under oppression to come to democracy and a market economy. They know what they want to do, they don't know how to do it. So you'll find a lot of small businessmen wanting to know how to set up in business. I hope we'll be able to bring them over on courses here, not only to tell them, but to show them. That will be part, I hope, of charitable work, and we'll be able to give them courses at universities, polytechnics, colleges, specifically set up for them, and they'll know that they have some place to go to get sound, practical advice. That is part of the work. Uh, then, if there's anything that is non-charitable work, which is perhaps furthering the political beliefs that I believe in, and which I believe were very successful in Britain, that will come through the company limited by guarantee. May I put this to you? I don't want to be rude when I put this to you, but it is a matter of public record that there's been a lot of criticism in the newspapers about your son Mark Thatcher's role I in please, this. Please, may I stop you? Yes, of course. I am not here to be interviewed about my son except to say that he has been a marvellous son to me, always, and still is. He is not a trustee of the Foundation, but he will work very hard for it. That is precisely the point that I wanted to put you, to invite you to say whether you wanted to say anything about it, and you've made the position clear on that, so I think we can move on. Can I stop you? Can I stop you? Still rolling, Michael? Yeah. yeah. Just That's be fine. careful because you're just appearing yeah. in shot after your arm sometimes. Okay. okay. Right, fine. I'll pick up just on my, <coughs> my reply there, which gives us a, a <coughs> point to get into the interview again. Okay? Yes, still rolling. That's precisely the point I wanted to raise with you, Mrs. Thatcher. As you say, there has been a criticism. I've invited you to make the comment that you've done, and you've made the comment. And let me say, when he works the foundation, he works for nothing. He works voluntarily. Can we move on then to Europe? You've been very much centre stage over the last two or three days, and last night you voted for the government motion. You supported John Major, as you said you would. would. But when it comes to what has decided at Maastricht, if that is an arrangement whereby Britain signs up for economic and monetary union, but with an opt-out clause. Will you still support, uh, support the Prime Minister? Well, now, let me make it quite clear. I hope I did in the speech I made in the House. But when your Prime Minister is going abroad to negotiate on behalf of your country, then you do vote for him. You vote for him because you hope that he will do his level best for everything that I believe in as far as Britain is concerned. Britain is unique in Europe in the importance of her parliament in the lives of the people. Others haven't had a parliament anything like as old as ours. They don't have such regard to their parliaments. The people don't see politicians brought to account for how they carry out their duties in the same way overseas as they do here. Now, what is at issue in Maastricht is how much of the parliamentary duties, responsibilities to look after the financial affairs of this country and the pound sterling are going to be handed over to Europe. 
I hope, practically none. I don't think people want to see those things handed over to another non-elected body in Europe, either to the Commission, and remember it was not very long ago that Monsieur Delors said very soon 80% of the economic decisions will be taken in Brussels. No. Nor do I believe the economic decisions should be taken and monetary decisions by a central bank not accountable to the people. We in our lives and through the lifetime of our country have been very important in Europe. We've had a great influence on Europe. We've fought for Europe. We've fought for her liberty when she was under oppression. So many, many people lie in Flanders Field. No one can say that we're not European in that sense. Our history has been bound up with it. But when we joined, we thought we joined as rather proud, independent countries, cooperating together consulting together, and of course at that time France was very much of the same mind. You remember de Gaulle was a Europe of nation states, and also so was Pompidou. And I do not like the idea of going into a federation at all that would be giving up our parliamentary powers, and I believe that most people don't want that, giving up a lot of our parliamentary powers, and you'll see there's already a bid for the Commission uh, and the uh, a central bank in Europe to wield quite a lot of our powers. I should not like that. I don't think the people of Britain would like that. I don't think to have one twelfth of a say in what happens in Europe is a good bargain for the whole say of what happens at home. But you see, Sir Leon Britton, our commissioner, says what is on offer at Maastricht is almost certainly going to be a good bargain for Britain because it means, to use that well-used metaphor, you can get on board the EMU train but you can decide whether you're going to stay on board or jump off through the opt-out clause. Now, isn't that a good deal for Britain? I think you're well advised to use the word train. Because if you're getting on a board a train, you're going to a particular destination. If you don't like that destination, it's best not to get on board. The whole structure of the treaty, in my view, is shaped and framed as a kind of conveyor belt. And if you get on, you've had to sign up to the destination of the concept of a single currency. And then you're already in the exchange rate mechanism. You go from 6% margins linked with your other fellow countries to 2.5% margins. Then they want you to go locked. And then you say, I want to get off. By that time, you haven't got much choice left. You're being dragged along. But if you don't like the destination, it's best not to get on. But you shouldn't stop other countries from doing what they want to do. I don't think we should be stopped. When we wanted to go to the Gulf, way ahead of the other countries, we weren't stopped, nor should we be stopped on foreign affairs. As but a matter of fact, it's very ironic. We were the country with oil, the only country in Europe, apart from Norway, the only country in the community that has oil. But we were the first to go to the Gulf. So. I think you should be very, very wary of signing up to this. I don't myself believe the British people want it. It is their rights that are being given away, not parliamentarians. It is their rights to hold people who will come before them as candidates, to hold them to account to the people. And that's why I feel so very strongly about it. But let me put it to you this way. Isn't this really rather old-fashioned stuff? a sentimental attachment, if you like, to having the Queen's head on the five-pound notes. And haven't we gone past that? Haven't we gone to the stage where the emu is going to happen? No, that's what they're trying to convince you. And that's why they hope you'll get on the train. That is totally false. And it is not only the Queen's head on our pound notes. Important as that is, Parliament is the monarch, the Lords and the Commons. And when you take away the responsibilities of that parliament for the financial affairs of the nation. And that's what you'll be doing. You take away the right to issue your own currency, not only now, but for always, for always, for future generations. You take away that right, or you agree to that right being taken away, and you take away the right to run the financial affairs. They can say how much deficit you should have. They can say how much you should borrow. If you go above that, they have the right to fine you to fine you. They then say, well, you can't, in fact, get any money out of the European bank for investment. That's quite absurd. But on the, other, 
On the other I, hand, I, that's I on the monetary side, but you, but Britain would retain, for example, what's called the fiscal side, the whole business of raising our own taxes, what you do with taxes internally in the country, that would still be in British hands, wouldn't it? it no, it most certainly would not. If you're told you can only have a certain deficit, then you're told virtually how much you have to raise in tax or how much you have to cut your expenditure. Once you start on that road, they can go on telling you, and believe you me, as you know full well from some of the diktats that have come out of the Commission, uh, they are really thirsty for power. They like it, they're non-elected, uh, they can come and make decisions by a simple majority. But this is not for a proud nation, and there's nothing old-fashioned about being ch in charge of your own financial affairs, whether as a family, as a business, or as a country. Well, let me ask you then, because it sounds very much to me as though there's not much likely to come out of Maastricht on EMU that you could possibly agree with. Am I right on that? I believe we have gone far enough on the European monetary system which we joined long before as Prime Minister, and then we joined the exchange rate part of it in the last year. My advice was that if we did that, that would be as much as was ever required of us. Now, I should perhaps have known that the moment you accept one thing, it becomes the basis for many, many other demands. Now, I think that the, the uh, Europe is going about things quite the wrong way. The moment you get one agreement, for example, we did get agreement on a single market. As a matter of fact, that's what we joined the community for many years ago. We just got agreement on it, for which we had to have some majority voting in order that other countries couldn't stop us from having a fair deal on some things. Now, that was a single European Act. It was passed in 1988. It's not fully into effect until the end of 1992. And yet before that, a year ago, the rest of them say, right, we want another intergovernmental conference. Now, that decision can be taken by simple majority, so you've no power to stop it. Want another intergovernmental conference, and here we are on another move, lurch forward, I believe, to federalism. Well, and you know, hold on a moment. And if we get through this one, they say they want another one in 1996. Now, there's no stability or feeling of political security in this. You're going to be change, change, change. What they should be doing now is negotiating on world trade through the GATT. It's world trade that matters, not blocks. And we are, I'm afraid, at odds with the United States, which is a very, uh, very dangerous thing to be. And I think that we're in the wrong because the United States and the third world countries are saying, look, you take down your subsidies on agriculture and stop coming into our markets. And as a matter of fact, our people aren't getting a fair deal on agriculture. And that's stopping world trade on the wider campus from being negotiated. That possibility of those negotiations ends with the, clo the close of this year. It's already been extended a year. They're looking inward, looking inward onto inward trade. They're excluding East Europe from trading with us on some things. Mr. Well, Brunson? When Europe looks inward, America will one day go home. That would be very dangerous indeed. We should look genuinely internationalist. Internationalism is cooperation between nation states, and that's what we should be concentrating on. Well, now, you referred to the Single European Act, and I've got the text of it here with me. And there are references here, and this is what you signed up to, your government signed up to, there are references here already to extending common policies and pursuing new objectives in the community. There's another one over the page here, we're talking about concrete progress towards European unity. And then there are words further on about uh, uh, monetary union, ensuring the convergence of economic and monetary policies. Shouldn't you have called a referendum on that? No, that was the single market, the common market, is right in the beginning of the Treaty of Rome. If you look to the preamble of the Treaty of Rome, it has words about economic union right in the very beginning, 1958 when it was signed. That's in the Treaty of Rome. But this if goes you, much well, further. Moment, this is extending moment, common policies and pursuing moment, If you objectives. then have, in 1972, the, before we joined, the countries agreed to the progressive realisation of economic and monetary union before we went in. That's what we were landed with when we went in. Now, what I did in that act, 
if you look at the head of one of the sections, you'll find that economic and monetary union had never, never been defined. And the top of one particular section, I made an attempt to define it. It's called economic and monetary cooperation. Yes. Go on, I think yes. it's a... Economic and monetary cooperation, yes. Yes. brackets, yeah. economic and monetary. And that was the first time we'd taken it down from full union to cooperation. But and that was, what I, uh, that was what I tried to do. And that, I'm afraid, is what will be overturned now. But we were landed right at the beginning with this phrase, which no one had ever defined, and it lay there meaningless for quite a time. Then all of a sudden, the others are trying to go to federation. We were assured when we went in, we would not lose sovereignty. We were assured in many, many different ways, and that has been the history. Go in and you're assured that you'll have sovereignty, that your courts will be all right, and that your main institutions will be all right, and you won't lose your national identity. Gradually, it is moving faster and faster to losing sovereignty. People call it pooling sovereignty. If you give up your sovereignty over your currency, that is one say over sovereignty, and you will never have it again. It is a loss of sovereignty. Well, now, see, you're calling for the referendum in the situation which you envisage in the future, where all three of the main parties will have agreed to economic and monetary union, yes. and probably political union at the yes. same time. Yes. That will, that will yes. have been agreed. And you're saying, are you not, that in that circumstance the people must choose. But may I put it to you, aren't you really saying that that will have been a decision taken by the sovereign parliament of this country, which you will not agree with, and you will want to go over the heads of parliament to the people? That's why you want a referendum, isn't it? Well, you could argue that the other people, the other side, won't have a referendum because they think they might lose it. That would be the kind other part of your argument. No, get away from that sort of scrap. Get away from personalities. What we're talking about is the biggest diminution of parliamentary responsibility that we've known, I believe, in the lifetime of our parliament. Some would say there was a great diminution when we went into the community, and to give Mr. Callaghan his due, and he came in and renegotiated it, he had a referendum. He had a referendum. This is taking away the power of the people to make MPs accountable to the people in our parliament, to be able to ask your MPs about all economic policies, all taxation policies, uh, to ask them and see them answer in the House of Commons, not to say, well, this is a matter for the European community, but I will argue this but to be accountable. It is the people's powers that are being taken away. And it is quite wrong to deny them a choice. Quite wrong. Indeed, I think it's very arrogant indeed. Now, that's not a new thought. If you look at the famous lawyer on the Constitution, Dicey, you'll find him saying there, in a very, very powerful introduction to, to the, the uh, I think it was the eighth volume of Dicey, look, there are times when Parliament does not represent the people and how are the people's voice to be heard. Now, that doesn't mean on everything where the Parliament is at odds, but on a constitutional issue where the House of Commons in particular has been responsible for money bills, not the House of Lords. You're taking away the rights of the people to hold us to account, and some MPs want to get shot of the responsibility. I don't. I much prefer to have the responsibility. I much prefer to make the decisions. I much prefer to be accountable and say so in the form of the people. It's the people's rights on a big scale that would be going. And really, are we going to be so arrogant as to suggest? Three parties agree on this, therefore you can't have a voice. Not to my way of thinking. I think more of the views, the opinions, the instinctive sense of the character of the people of this country. And we are very different in character from people on the continent. That's why in two world wars we've been able to do so much, to defeat the forces of oppression and save uh, liberty for Europe and bring them back to liberty. But may I press you on this matter of the referendum? A member of the government today that I was talking to said quite bluntly, they said, Mrs Thatcher has gone wobbly on this, to use your phrase that you were using first and Mr. Hurd used back at you uh, yesterday. For this reason, he said, Mrs. Thatcher has always been against referendums and there was no finer example of that of when she vehemently opposed the 1975 referendum. Yes, I had to. I had to, Mr. Bronson. I took over from Mr. Heath and he had already said 
that we were opposed to a referendum. And it was when I was actually going through all of the authorities and looking through all of the legal precedents, came across the dicey work, came across work by the Goodhearts, came across many other works. Then, of course, gradually one has to realise that the future of Northern Ireland is determined by what's called a border poll. It is a referendum. So it's not, we're not a stranger to referenda. There have been referenda in this country before. But I don't want to see many referenda. Therefore, I have always restricted it to a big constitutional issue. Of course, uh, we had a referendum on Scotland, we had a referendum on Wales. I've always been against a referendum on capital punishment because that's not a constitutional issue. Now, a constitutional issue is one which affects our institutions very considerably indeed, which alters our fundamental liberties. And it was when that I was arguing that that I realised that there were occasions on which we should have a referendum. And when you've got the three parties, all of them split, got the three parties, I don't think the Liberal Party is split, but it's very small, the parties split, but each of them saying, elect us, and we each uh, agree to a single currency, say, the people, they will be denying the people the right to have any effective say. And don't forget, they can't then go back if they haven't given the people a choice and say, I have a mandate to do this. But take my own case, for example. I would be very, very much against uh, uh, going into a single currency. Then I have to look and see, do I vote Conservative or Labour? Well, obviously I vote Conservative because I don't want all of the other tremendous drawbacks of Labour. But I would be very much against having the powers of the people taken away. So you wouldn't and go the, only Mr. Sensible thing, uh, the only sensible thing to do is to say, right, this is such an important issue that we should have a referendum. It's an important issue in Northern Ireland about the future of Northern Ireland. No one, no one uh, argues about that having a referendum. Well, then so, what do you make in this circumstance? But no, of one the, moment. I'm sorry. Now, let me turn the tables on you, because you haven't, in fact, put the other question. What is the answer of the government who says, speeches at the party conference, we believe in choice, we will give the people choice. What is the answer of the government? How are they to give the people choice about whether or not their powers shall be taken away by this parliament? Well, the answer from the, uh, the government's point of view was made very clear, was it not, by the Prime Minister, John Major. John you... Major, first of all, said that parliament is sovereign. He disagrees with you that this is such a major issue. If I and indeed, he has absolutely categorically, as far as he's concerned, ruled out a referendum. He says one will not be offered after Maastricht. I'm aware he's of again. that. And he still has to answer the question, how then will the people make their views known on whether or not they want their powers taken away. And it is a very serious question, and it is a question which, to which that is no answer. But I think John Major will say, at the election. It is not. If at the election there is no choice between the three parties on this great constitutional issue, how is a person to vote who says, I do not want our powers taken away. Our parliament is central to the life of our nation. It was the chimes of Big Ben that rang out across Europe during the war. I do not want our powers taken away. How is he to make that view known? Is he to abstain well, and therefore be deprived? No, it's for the government to answer. You can't, Mr Brunson, but they haven't answered it. A government that believes in choice is depriving the people of choice on a big constitutional issue, and a government that it proposes to do, and I don't know yet what it does, do so much injury to the Constitution by taking such a big chunk of it away, is not in a position to plead the Constitution. Parliamentary supremacy means the supremacy of the voice of the people. It is the voice of the people. If you deny that to be heard, I think it is arrogant and I think it is wrong. Aaron. I believe passionately in Parliament. I believe passionately in, in the, 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 the voice of the people. The only authority we have is the ballot box. That is all. And it is taken away from us at least at five yearly intervals. Then for, then for members of Parliament to go and in their campaign, in effect, to say to the people, yes, we all agree, it doesn't matter who you let, we're going to take your powers away. 
and you're going to have no say in it. Well, I'm afraid that's not my idea of how to conduct an election. In that case, what are they going to do? You'll find extremist candidates coming up, and you'll find that they'll vote for them, some of them. There's three great big parties. It happens it, that they're split. There are two main parties and one other. It happens they're both split. And there's one such obvious way to deal with it, because it's a constitutional matter, and that is by a referendum. It gives them the voice of the people. They have it in Northern Ireland. We had it for Scotland. We had it for Wales. What? We had it, actually, with Mr Callaghan on Europe. He, in fact, I think, the Labour Party had campaigned against Europe. In those days, there was a choice. The Labour Party had campaigned against Europe. The Conservative Party fought, including me, because I believed then, and I still believe, in cooperation between nation states, and that's to our advantage. I believe in a common or single market. I don't believe in passing over authority over our lives on many other things which the Commission is trying to do, and which I'm sure Mr Major will vote against. But the other thing is you get control over the economic and financial affairs of a nation, and you've got them. And I don't believe in handing that over. Well, you've spoken with obvious passion. Arrogant and wrong. Those are strong words to use, and that's in the connection of that is not my being... View. We're talking about the issues. That is my view. But you're also making absolutely plain that as far as you can see, EMU has gone quite far enough and couldn't go further. I don't see how you can continue to give your support to John Major. When my Prime Minister is going to argue, I said what I have said now in the House of Commons. He knows the views of many of us. They are held passionately. I've been a long time in that parliament. Mr Heath holds the alternative view, equally passionately. Except there's one difference. I'm prepared to submit that viewpoint to the people. An advisory referendum. I'm prepared really to be guided by the people, because our only authority comes from the people. They are not. That's the difference. Just in closing, if I may, because you've made your views very plain, as I said, on Europe and on the referendum, I just want to look back with you briefly over this past year. It's a year to the day since you had to leave Downing Street. No, it is a year to the day since I resigned. A year Freely. to the day since you resigned, yes. But have you really... I had more votes than anyone else. I know that you hold that very dear, but... Have you really come to terms with it? Yes. I wondered when you said that slip of the tongue yesterday in the House of Commons, you see, when you referred to my foreign secretary. One or two people said, well... You know, I said he we was my foreign secretary. Yes, he was my foreign secretary. I had several foreign secretaries. He was my foreign secretary when we were in power. But I think people saw that as almost a slip of the tongue. No, it almost wasn't a they, slip at all. They it saw you, I think. The wider point, though, I think, is that people were saying afterwards, said, Mrs Thatcher really hasn't got over it. And she really fact, can't come to terms quite with the fact that she isn't Prime Minister still. Well, how still. silly can they get? He was my Foreign Secretary. He was Her Majesty's Foreign Secretary. His Foreign Secretary in my government. Just as Nigel Lawson was Chancellor. John Major was also Chancellor. Geoffrey Howe was Foreign Secretary. He was my Foreign Secretary. How silly can you get about splitting hairs when there are such great issues to be determined? Greater issues at the moment on the European matter, greater issues on the wider world scene, which I think President Reagan and I and Mr Gorbachev did a great deal to bring about. Stop splitting hairs and get on with the real big issues. Let me then put the question just this other way. Have you really been able to come to terms with Yes, it? of course I have. I have been extremely busy. I have invitations from all over the world, from all over the country. I have requests to do so many things I can't possibly do them all. I speak, I have made quite a lot of uh, 10 or 11 really major speeches on the way ahead, which is what interests me all the time, as it will forever. I have been on many, many foreign tours. I have been up and down the country. As a matter of fact, you, when you're up and down this country, you don't get anything like the publicity you do when you're abroad. It's very, very ironic. And we have um, uh, three things to do, to try to influence the future, as most prime ministers do, first by letting their views be known through many, many of the media, and we hold strong views. We are a country of free speech. Why shouldn't we? very strong views, uh, and I do that both at home and abroad. Then I also have now started the foundation, and thirdly, 
I have to get down a full and complete record of my years in Downing Street and then also a full and complete record of how I came to have those views uh, when I was politically coming up to, well, first being elected, then a parliamentary secretary, then a member of the cabinet, then I was in opposition, and how I came to have those views and why I still think they are so very relevant to the wider world. It's just very, very ironic that as I went, the views which I espoused, which I fought for, which we implemented in Britain, have been the views which have been adopted by the ex-communist world, by most people who now believe in liberty and justice and democracy, and that you must have what is called a market economy, a Western-style economy. I had to fight really to fight to get those adopted in this country. We did a certain amount of denationalization, and then they said, oh, consolidate. We did a certain amount of uh, property, uh, letting people purchase their houses at a preferential rate. Oh, many, many people fought it. We got the rate of taxation right down because we said people want incentives to work. We said, look, in the last century, the task was to increase the vote to everyone in this country. In this century, our task is to get everyone uh, owning some capital, having a little bit of independence it brings, whether it's in housing, whether it's in stocks and shares. We were doing well. And uh, that is the whole recipe which works, because it's in tune with the talents and abilities and the feeling of this people. And let me say once again, as I said in the House of Commons, the character of the British people is unique. It is that which has shaped our institutions. It is that which has made them so valuable. It is that which makes us stand up for liberty more fiercely than any other country in Europe. And we must never submit that character to any other nation. But you've spoken with such passion about the way that you think possibly this country may be about to take a misguided step. Well, and I wonder, and I put it to you, don't you sometimes still feel, my goodness me, if I were still Prime Minister, things would be very different? What is the point of thinking that? It may well be correct, because I took the decisions in a very clear way and, and very, very firmly, and there was always a reason why and we went out and said, this is what we're going to do. This is why we're going to do it. Uh, uh, but uh, these things did happen a year ago. I totally accept them. I still have a role. And I hope that the things that I have said will influence the Prime Minister at Maastricht. We don't know what he'll come back with. And what is more, don't think that the views I hold are uniquely held in this country. There are many, many peoples in other countries of Europe who are getting really rather worried about the things that are happening. I understand why Germany wants somehow to, to, to get a kind of federation. There is a reason. It's connected with the German people, as our character and our parliament is connected with us. Because there are many, many people in Germany who feel a little bit uneasy about what may happen in the future, as it's happened in the past. You saw on the anniversary of Kristallnacht, there were demonstrations of the old kind, which we hope never to see again, by a small number of people. And, they were, and there were masses more people who were against them. But of course there is an uneasy feeling. And of course most German people want to do everything they can to see that that does not happen again. And I'm quite certain that so long as Chancellor Cole is there, he will be such a fervent friend of the West and of America. That, alas, isn't true of all countries um, in Europe. Indeed, at one time, your European credentials were judged by how anti-American you were. Very silly, very stupid. You will not keep security in Europe unless America stays here. And that is the single most important thing, most important thing. And the fact that with the common agricultural policy, we rather not getting on very well with America, with her agricultural policy, or with the GATT, is very serious. These changes, they're bringing them in too fast. People are against them, and they're against, I think, their fundamental instinct, and we should not be allowed, allow ourselves to be dragged along. Someone said, or a number of people said, oh, you must, you must, the other 11 will do it. When did Britain follow the other 11? just because they wanted to do it. That's a recipe for whatever you say, we'll do it. 
Whatever happened to the British lion? Of whom Winston said it was a privilege to give the roar. And of course Winston said, 1953, we will be with Europe but not of it. When they ask us why we take that view, we will say we dwell in our own land. Now I was for, I voted for Europe right at the beginning. I believe in the Europe of my vision. That is, proud, independent nations cooperating together. Yes, we co cooperate very closely together over trade. We do have the agricultural policy, and I must say I don't, still don't believe we've got a fair enough deal for our farmers. It's still too much hinged towards some of the farmers in Germany and France. But I think they're wanting to go too far, too fast. I did the Single European Act to get the single market, which was why we joined the community in the first place. They were modest changes. What is proposed now is a very, very big constitutional change, giving up our rights as people, not only for this generation, but giving up, could be giving up the right to issue our currency for future generations. Now, I don't think the Prime Minister will come back having signed up to a single currency. The que I'm, indeed, I'm pretty sure he won't. No, I'm pretty sure he won't. He's made it plain he won't. The question but he is, will come up with an opt-out clause. Yes, he will. But you see, you don't need an opt-out clause unless you're going to put the whole thing into the Treaty of Rome. And once you put that into the Treaty of Rome, you come under a European court which overrides our own courts. And those courts will say, well, you're going further to integration, and they will always give a decision against us. And that is why, if they want it to go this way, I wouldn't dream of stopping other countries from wanting to do it. The Guild is already closely linked to the Deutsche Mark. The Luxembourg franc is already closely linked to the... is, is, is unfree from the Belgian franc. If they want to, uh, they, 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 have, they, they don't have sea all around their coasts. We have, different, they, we have a different kind of board. If they want to go ahead... Yes, of course they can do it. Uh, the Deutsche Mark will be the most strongest influence in that currency. If they want to go ahead, it's not for us to stop them, it's for us to and facilitate We shall be a weak it. little currency but on the edge of it, No, we? we most certainly shall not. Have a little bit more faith in your own fellow countrymen. It was we who rolled back the frontiers of socialism, and we were the first country to do it. And in my early days at Downing Street, one finance minister came to me to say, Mrs Thatcher, we're watching you very carefully. You're the first prime minister who's tried to roll back the frontiers of socialism. And if you succeed, other countries will follow. We did succeed. We restored Britain's reputation, and other countries did follow. Have a little bit more confidence in our people. Get the right system of government, and enabling them to, to display their talents and abilities, and will do very well. As a matter of fact, we now have a better structure in industry than the Germans. They're trying to foist a lot of their high costs upon us because they know in due time it'll make them become uncompetitive. So they say, have a social charter and foist the limited number of working hours, the limited number of night work, all sorts of limits upon us by a social charter. I remember when... Um, I was a, a president of Europe. You see, the, you see the, what are called the social partners, which is the trade unions. They come to you and they wanted it put in uh, to uh, what was called a European directive that we shall have no more than 35 hours in a working week. And I said, certainly not. And I know why they wanted to do it, because some of them had already got only 35 hours. I said, if you want, only want to work 35 hours a week, that's up to you. I'm not going to stop people who wish to work longer than 35 hours a week to benefit their families, to build up their capital, to get a nicer house. No, that's what they want, to foist their high costs upon us. And then what will happen? We shall have a high protective border around Europe because we've become high cost. And other people will not be able to keep up their productivity as fast. Sometimes I say to some of the EFTA countries, why do you want to come in and actually join Europe in a closer association? Oh, some of them say we think you're going protectionist and we want to get in under the wire. We didn't join a common market to become protectionist. We joined it to get free trade within as an example to the wider world. But it's the wider world we should be aiming at. We're not doing our stuff in GATT. We're becoming inward-looking blocks. Now, we've arrived at the point at which we started. We must not become inward-looking blocks. Our life this century has been to rescue Europe, to be with Europe, 
to cooperate with it, but always to know that the greatest alliance for liberty the world has ever known is the Anglo-American alliance. And we must keep that going as the background to the liberty and justice and democracy which other peoples in the world want to develop. Now, I just want to thank you very much for, for uh, giving us such a long interview. We could go on talking for a, a very long time. We've just had a request from um, our friends in Dutch television because, as you know, Mr Lubbers um, is here today. So I wonder, um, I mean, do feel free to say no, he would have to answer this if wanted. But could I just ask you this? Mr Lubbers is in London today. We're in the final stages of Maastricht. What do you think of the way the Dutch have hand, uh, the way in which the Dutch have handled this presidency, and the way in which Mr. Lubbers has handled things? Well, I'm a great fan of Mr. Lubbers, because there have been many, many occasions in Europe when I've had to lead with an argument, and he's been the only one who's come into support. I think the Dutch were our great friends when we went in. We are very similar. Don't forget, in uh, 1688, we got got a king who was Dutch and came over, and so we had a very close, we do have a very close association. And I'm a great fan of Hans van den Broek, their foreign secretary. Uh, so I, uh, I like both, I've worked with both, I've been immensely grateful to both for their cooperation with us. Alas, it hasn't gone well. I think, and it didn't go well in the Luxembourg presidency, which was the last one, and I think it is for this reason that those smaller countries get far more out of being in a community because they get a good deal more importance by being a president of a community than they would naturally have on their own as a smaller country. We are a bigger country, and perhaps had a bigger country been in charge, it wouldn't have brought forward quite those documents in quite that way. They've pushed too hard for federalism, you Yes, feel. yes, I do. And, and I feel that they haven't had an instinct for other people. You push too hard, you get a very quick reaction. Uh, and I can feel it. I, if, look, I, I've just had one uh, sort of way of f feeling, of judging people. If I feel a resentment, then I know full well that other people usually feel a resentment. I mean, if I feel an instinct very quickly, I usually find that that's what... Um, British people feel politics is, is a matter of sense, reason, instinct. The three qualities are different. Common sense and reasoning things out and instinct. And you have to combine all three. Uh, and it's also that you, want, you always want to conserve the very best. And you also want to make progress. And it's a blend of getting those two. And they're going too fast. And they're signalling. If they get what they want on this, then, in fact, their goal is federalism. No. If their argument were correct, then as you go to trade worldwide, you'd have a single market, you'd have to have a single currency worldwide. Silly, isn't it? A single country, a single currency. A single country, a single currency. That is the rule. Thank you very much indeed. As always, <laughs> you've given us about five hours of editing there. <laughs>